Good hey, afternoon. Everybody. Hi, everybody. How Hello you doing? Hello there. Welcome to the Javits Center, one of the most beautiful rooms in New York City. <laughs> um, my name is uh, Sam Sifton. I'm the national editor of the New York Times, but that's not what brings me here today. Um, I'm here because I'm the newspaper's former restaurant critic and, and uh, former dining editor and, uh, and the author of a forthcoming book called Thanksgiving, which I hope you'll buy because it'll teach you how to make Thanksgiving well. And um, I'm, I'm joined today by, by my friends uh, David Venable and, and, and Bobby Dean. Um, David, you guys, you don't, you have, I should just talk for a long time because you have no idea who I am and you know who these guys are. <laughs> Um, you know David, of course, from QVC and, and his terrific show, and, and, and you're going to know his terrific new uh, cookbook, and, and, and you, you know Bobby, of course, from the Cooking Channel and his terrific show and his terrific new uh, cookbook. So I thought what we'd do is I'd ask these gentlemen a, a bunch of questions. We'd talk about food, talk about our books, talk about this kind of stuff we have going on with, with home cooking and, and comfort foods. And then we throw it open to a few questions from, from you guys. And uh, these guys will answer, and we'll, we'll see how we do. That sound sounds great. Okay with you, gentlemen? Sounds good to me. All right. Okay, so here we are, three guys with no real classical training in cooking, not a lot of French in our past, I think. Um, and yet, uh, we, we've all managed to forge a, a, a life in, in, in the restaurant world. Um, I, 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 for myself, did used to work in, in restaurants in, in college, and, and I've reported on food my whole professional life. But can, can you tell us a little bit about your background in food that led you that, well, to I this Well, I think chair? in my situation, I've always loved great food. Food has always been a great celebration for me. I remember growing up, and mom, I would be coming to the house, and the first question was, what's for dinner? Because that was always the most important thing to me in the evening. Not only the food, but gathering around the dinner table with my family. Because when I grew up, if the phone rang during dinner time, you never answered it. And if the television was turned on, it got turned off in a hurry because mom believed that family dinner time was just that, the time for the family to reconnect. So I associated food with that family time and that time to be able to get together. I've always had a great love affair with food. I always say that we have a long relationship when we go way back. So I, I come to this job, this job at QVC, hosting In the Kitchen with David, already loving great food and loving to discover new types of cooking. And when I had the opportunity to take over the show, it really was an opportunity for me to invite our viewers in to talk about great food and great cooking, but I'm a home cook, I'm not a chef. So I'll bring the celebrities onto my show, we'll learn together, and we'll find out what it is that we can do to elevate our cooking one step at a time. I think for the most of us, we just don't venture outside of where we're comfortable cooking because it's all we've ever known. So what I encourage our, our foodies that watch QVC and watch In the Kitchen with David is just really elevate things with maybe one ingredient, one level at a time. So I come to this very honestly with a great personal love of food, but also a great curiosity about cooking and uh, learning right alongside our viewer. And my book is all about comfort food. It's the kind of comfort food that really brings you back home and back around the dinner table. And I grew up down south, much like Bobby. Yep. But you know, comfort food isn't limited to the south. Comfort food is wherever you find it. It's the food you grew up on. If you think right now, what was the favorite dish that your mom or your grandmom or your dad, whoever did the cooking, what was that one dish you always looked forward to when they told you that was what was for dinner? And as you grew older and came home to visit again, what was the one dish you hoped they'd make? because it really reminded you of that time when you were with family and with the people you loved most. So my book celebrates that. My philosophy in cooking is all about that, bringing people you love around the dinner table and letting the common thread be the great food that brings you together. Well, that sounds mm. fair. That's a very smart that answer, seems, David. It seems like a smart answer. Now, you, <laughs> you're new answer. to the food game, I know. I, <laughs> new to the food, yeah, well. I kid about that. I, I have a long and storied relationship that with food as well. I'm a southern guy, too. I'm from, uh, I'm from Albany, Georgia, which is Spelled the same way as Albany, New York, but we pronounce it a little differently. Uh, my mother is Paula Dean, and my hero. I grew up around, obviously, around incredible food, much like you did, and sure. I'm, I'm fortunate in that uh, I live very near my mom, and my favorite things that she cooked for me when I was a kid are, are still available. I still go over to her house and eat on Sundays, and uh, my, uh, my favorite thing in the world is my mama's goulash, and probably really? probably everybody's mama has done it, and I've talked about this a lot, but it's basically a glorified beefaroni. You guys know what I'm talking about. Sure. sure. And it's just there's just something about your mama's cooking 
that you that you just that you that you crave and that it's very difficult to re recreate. I can cook fairly well. My mom might disagree because my stuff is a whole lot lighter than what hers is. <laughs> but I I get that goulash every year on my birthday. My my mother knows that when my birthday rolls around, she's making goulash that day, and I'll be over to eat. And I try to only eat it that one day every year. Well, well once a couple of years ago, I. Was I said I want it so bad, and I was making it at my house, but mine, in the past, had come out a little differently than my mother's. So I called my mom and I said, "Mom, I'm, I'm making goulash, and it's just it's it doesn't look like yours. It's not coming out right." And she said, "Well, t t take me through the process. What have you done?" I said, "Well, I, I browned the ground beef and then I drained it." She said, "Stop right there." <laughs> <laughs> I said, "Oh, okay." Oh, uh, here we go. <laughs> you took away what I, made it good. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Right. So. Anyhow, I, I, I am a really, really lucky man. Um, I, I'm excited about the book that's coming out with Random House. The, 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 the premise of everything that I do now as an adult, I'm 42 years old, and when I turned 30, I, I met a really important person in my life, and that's a guy named Sam Carter, who is my uh, best friend and, and closest confidant, and he happens to be a, uh, a Marine and a, um, a, a a strength and conditioning coach for a local college in Savannah. And I have the good fortune of, of working out with him. And uh, it's sort of, at 30, I began that process. And, and it sort of changed my relationship with food. So I've been on a mission to try to create great foods, but do them as lightly as I can in very elementary ways. And this book is, uh, if I had to sum it up, not nearly as smartly as David did, but I would say that that's sort of what it is. Well, let's talk just for a moment about uh, about this issue of uh, strength, conditioning, food. Um, I, I, I was the restaurant critic for the Times, which put me out in restaurants six, sometimes seven nights a week, 12 or more meals a week, and none of these 350 calories or less yeah, meals, right. all of them uh, at the height. Of, and, and everyone always said, Why, you know, well, you don't blow up like a tech. And, and the answer was, of course, uh, this balance between eating and exercise. Sure. Right. Is it, 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 do you find that this is true for, for you as well? Well, it, very, very definitely, because I think everything, Bobby would probably agree, everything in moderation, including moderation. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah I right. Think Especially you, moderation. Exactly. Right. The pendulum can swing, uh, and if we're not careful, we can go too far one way or the other. So I think it's important to, to find, as you mentioned, balance. It's about portion control, it's about equal parts exercise and, and whatever exercise means to you. And I think for a lot of people, they think that means going to a gym and being uncomfortable. Uh, <laughs> if they're not in the shape That's they want to be what in. It is. <laughs> but you know what, exercise is about moving, it's about walking, it's about doing things that get you up and out of a sedentary lifestyle. Yeah. And then that way, um, you're able to balance that with what you're eating. We can always lighten up, we can be smarter about what we're eating, but I think it's all about balance. It's all about making sure that you keep things in perspective. And, uh, and I think that's the biggest piece of it. All Just right, isn't that, that great? So we're done with our exercise. <laughs> now right. let's do some eating. We've All been right. talking, you, you mentioned Sunday dinner and, and, and then you mentioned uh, your birthday meal, having yeah. goulash at your mom's. Right. Today's my birthday. My birthday, oh. since I was 10 years old, has always been some form of an open-faced turkey sandwich. So it's no surprise that I ended up writing a book of, about Thanksgiving. I, it's a meal that I associate with my parents, with eating at home, with lots of great, lots of gravy and cranberry sauce. And, and, and I love this notion that once a year I will be able to get it and that excess will be celebrated, that this will be a, a, a moment of family and enjoyment. I know this is very important to you in, in, in your book, David. Can you talk a little bit, and Bobby, can you talk as well about how uh, we relate this notion of comfort food to this notion of family and Sunday dinner and the like? Well, I think the two go hand in hand because food is always that common thread that brings people back around the table. And I think about my mom's uh, cooking and the thing I loved most growing up. I come from a family of great cooks. My mom and both grandmothers are great cooks. But they're all very different cooks. And mom worked full time, so a lot of her cooking was not as much scratch cooking as my grandmothers did. Right. So I really felt like I benefited from all of that. My mom's Sunday beef pot roast, though, was beyond compare. It was something she cooked for four hours on top of the stove, and when she got it home, she made a pan gravy to go with it. Ooh. Mayonnaise drop biscuits to sop Ooh. up Ooh. all the gravy. Green beans from my grandmother's garden, because her mother grew a garden every summer and canned the beans at the end of the summertime. Yeah. 
Uh, we called my mom's mom Burnsy when she was alive. Her, her uh, last name was Burns. She wanted to be called Mother Burns, and it came out Burnsy <laughs> with the first grandchild, and so it stuck. So we called them Burnsy beans. So a classic Sunday celebration meal at my house growing up was my mother's beef pot roast, her drop biscuits, Burnsy beans, yeah. and usually some kind of potato to go along with it. So I think it's all about just finding the, the food that, that brings you joy, finding the food that really helps you celebrate those times together, because we all know what they are. And whether they're really elaborate scratch dishes or something that somebody made in a hurry, but it's what you love. It's what really makes you so happy and makes you excited to get home again. That's really, I think, what all of us need to find is that happy place with food. And the South is, is a very communal place, too. And, and yeah. you said it. I mean, food brings pe people together. It's the one thing that we all have in common. We all have to eat. And, and we, we, my mother has always said that the heart of the home is in the kitchen. She still says it right now today. And I believe that's completely true. I mean, we always gathered there. And as you can imagine, we had breakfast, lunch, and dinner was wonderful. There was not, I mean, we, we, we grew up fairly meagerly. So my mother had to cook, you know, what she could. So there was lots of yeah. dark meat chicken. And there was, you know, we, sweet tea was the beverage. and, and uh, The house wine of the South. Yes, <laughs> man, sweet tea. My God, I had to stop drinking. I, I overdid the sweet. There would literally be at our house a gallon jug, milk jug, of sweet tea oh, yeah. every day. On the See, we're in New York City. I can't believe I, that I still have my teeth. Because <laughs> sweet tea, they say sweet, you have to go to the South and experience sweet tea to understand that the emphasis is on the sweet, right, not right. on the tea. It's cups of, cups yeah. of sugar. Yeah. So even a half, if you, as a New Yorker, I can almost get away with saying, I'll have a half sweet tea, and they look at you a little funny, and then they bring you something that is, to my taste, very sweet tea. Yeah. Full yeah. sweet tea is very difficult. So you they can stand a here? knife up in it. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It, it's unbelievable. People mess it up by, people mess up sweet tea by trying to do it with cold tea, and you can't do that, obviously. Right. You got, you got to put it in, in you hot tea. Got to get tea. that sugar in early. And you got to get enough. My mama, golly, my mama's sweet tea. I, can't okay, so sweet tea and mayonnaise drop biscuits. Yes. I want to get and some my grandmother, drop I'll talk about my grandmother too while, while we're please, at Please, please. My grandma, we did that, everything that you just said, I can relate to. Uh, only my grandmother, Paul, lived in a trailer in Lee County, and she had a beautiful garden out back with, where she would grow beans and potatoes and yeah. all the stuff that you were just talking about. And she also grew switches, so that's where I would have to go pick my own <laughs> switches to get my legs whipped when I was a kid. Oh, I never boy. understood how they invite you to go get your to oh, get their weapon. Go get it, boy. I didn't understand that at all. Because you got to come back. You got to come back. Yeah. So, uh, but my grandma Paul, here's something funny about my grandma Paul, and I've said this before. She lived to be, and people say, you know, we get all kinds of knocks about our food in the South. But you know what my mother says, and this is true, we cook with tons of vegetables. I, yep. think that what, I think that what people get on us about is the fact that we batter and deep fry everything. Well, my grandmother Paul lived to be about 98 years old, and I swear, y'all, this is the truth. I remember this, seen it so many times. My grandma Paul would take her medicine with a tall boy Budweiser out of the can, and Fantastic. you could not kill Those that woman. Those are my woman. people. Could not kill that woman. And just the big can of lard up on the stove, I mean, it was, just the best, when my grandmother Paul, my Aunt Peggy, and Paula Dean got together and cooked. Lord have, have mercy. mercy. You, just, you just couldn't believe it. I'm a little it. nervous you just hearing about it. It's unbelievable, unbelievable. All right, so we talked about there's a, you know, there's, a, there's a garden out back. There's this notion of scratch cooking. We all understand, up here anyway, we all understand the importance of preparation for our cooking. And certainly when you're doing it on, on television, there, you've got all of the, everything, what the French call the mise en place is all set up for you and go. I think for a lot of people, a lot of home cooks, preparation is a difficult thing. It's, yeah. it's, it's a real issue uh, when people are reading recipes, can I make this now? oh, I have to go buy this thing. When I was doing the Thanksgiving helpline at the Times, I'd get a call on, on Thanksgiving morning from someone saying, I have a 15-pound frozen turkey. What's my first step? <laughs> a big sink <laughs> full of cold water is your first step. Yeah, and, and maybe you'll eat this weekend. I mean, the, the whole notion <laughs> of preparation is really important, and, and it's one that I really try and push in, 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 in my book. If you guys were to give some advice to a home cook, a novice home cook, someone who, who wants to just try and dial right. in and figure it out, what, yep. what would it be? The first thing I would say is read your recipe all the way through before you start cooking. I can't tell you the number of times I hear from someone who uses one of my recipes and said, David, I never knew that that reserved half cup chicken broth couldn't go all in at the beginning. 
right. and you needed it later in the recipe, and then right. suddenly there's no liquid at the end, and right. then suddenly you're in a mess, or the consistency is all wrong. Right. So I always encourage a home cook to read through the recipe completely. Make sure you've got all of your ingredients, because there's nothing more frustrating than to be halfway through to discover you've got to stop and go to the store. Yep. Or maybe you don't have that option on Thanksgiving morning. Yep. The other issue is making sure that you do take the time to do the prep, the mise en place. You know, it's a French term that means everything in its place. Take some time to put everything in into its own little um, bowl, its ramekin. Take that time to prep. It makes the cooking more joyful when you've got all the pieces in front of you. That is true. I, I would say, um, relative to, to the recipe portion of it, my mother has always given me creative license to do whatever I wanted to with the recipe. She taught me, when I was about six or seven is when I started cooking, when I could kind of see over the stove. She started sure. showing, showing me my way around. And my mother has always said, whenever you cook something, go exactly by the recipe, figure out what it is, and then any time after that, do whatever you'd like to. And if that means raise the decadence level, then you can do that. And, if, and that also means that if you'd like to cut back on it, which is basically what I've done, then you can do that too. But I think the number one thing, number one favor that you can do yourself, particularly if you were doing a Thanksgiving lunch or something like that for a group of people, is to don't ever do something that you've never cooked before. Make sure Absolutely. that you've got make sure that you've got practice at that dish and this is not the first time you're doing it. Because if you've got this beautiful turkey and you've only got one of them and everybody's here waiting on you to get it done and you've ruined it. The first time to fry a turkey mess. is not Thanksgiving, no, Thanksgiving it's not, morning. No, it's I love not. to do what I call a dry run of recipes. That's sometimes. correct. Absolutely. So sometimes I'll give it a, a test drive if I'm going to be having, to your point, guests over. Right. Because there's nothing more um, nerve wracking and terrifying than to find something's not working and guests are in the in the dining room waiting to be served. Yeah. Seriously, this is this is great free advice. This is the books cost money and you buy lots of them. <laughs> but the, 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 this advice, which no one will tell you. I'm telling you, we are the three most honest men in food right now. No one says. They say, this is a foolproof proof recipe. You can no, do it. No, it's not. It isn't. We're, I'm a fool. I've made that mistake. I, Make I it too. first. There's one Go more ahead. thing that's really important that we haven't covered here, and this is, a, this is a, an issue of your health, being careful. Um, when you're deep frying a turkey, <laughs> test, test with water before you, put, before you dip that turkey into hot oil and have it bubble over and you've got a great big that's house true. fire, please. Don't, so, and don't wear flip flops. Get your turkey. <laughs> don't get your turkey. Fill your pot with water, cold water. Dip your turkey in there to test the level of what you need before you put oil in there and heat it up. Because I have an many people have it. many people have burned <laughs> themselves and burned their houses down by That's that. That's a so. feature of the of the news the next morning, always, all Be across careful, America. Without but deep fried turkey is better than oven roasted, I think. Debates I, can rage. I've got recipes it's good. for both. It's good. All right, so listen, when I was restaurant critic, I went out to eat all the time, and, and, and I found that this started to inform my cooking. I picked up a, I still write a column for the Sunday Times Magazine where I quiz chefs about recipes and try and figure out how to make stuff at home. Where, where do you draw uh, inspiration for your recipes? Bob, well, my mother's got 16 or 17 books on the shelf, so I've got <laughs> years just, and years of work. Take them? All I got to do is just reach over and grab one and be like, okay, I can lighten that up. <laughs> <laughs> so so my, gotta... my inspiration is pretty obvious. My, my mother is my, is my culinary inspiration, but my, my father as well, and I'm sorry, David. Were no, you please go right ahead. My, my father as well, who is alive and well, and a lot of people don't, um, people don't get to hear enough about my father. I'm assuming that if you're here and you know who I am, that you probably know who my mother is. And my mother is married to a wonderful guy named Michael Groover, who is like family, and I love him like family. <clears throat> but my father is alive too. My, my brother and I, uh, our father is alive and well, and he's a super guy. He and my mother were uh, oil and water, so that didn't really work out very well. But he is a, uh, he's a great guy, and I'm really proud of him too. But he could cook his butt off. My mom would do all the stuff inside, but my daddy was outside driving that grill I mean, ch chickens, ribs, butts, anything you can imagine. They they were a good they were a good team. My mom would do all the sides, and Dad would be outside just pounding beer and killing the grill. <laughs> it's a lifestyle. Sorry, that's too much. That's too much information. I, I support that lifestyle. How about, how about, how about well, you, you know, for me, a lot of my comfort food, um, you know, Southern comfort food is what I was raised on, and that's where I draw a lot of inspiration. But I've also done a lot of research on what comfort food is like in other regions of the country. Mm. You know, all month long this month on In the Kitchen with David, we're taking a virtual road tour around the country, Very and nice. we're doing regional cuisine because I realize that we broadcast not just to people down south. And uh, while that's my culinary point of view and something that I'm very familiar with, 
I'm really learning to expand my horizons when it comes to New England baked beans and to do some other things like good Texas barbecue as opposed to a North Carolina pulled pork, which is a vinegar-based sauce. Mm -hmm. So it's all about really researching all that. But I also get a lot of my inspiration from our viewers. You know, the foodies that watch my show give us great, great feedback on the kinds of recipes they want to see. We also do themes on my show every Wednesday and Sunday, so that really drives creativity too. We use, I find the internet is an, uh, is an inexhaustible resource of so many different types of cooking and recipes because it inspires me to reach a little further and to do some things that are a little out of my um, area of familiarity. Uh -huh. And it just really, I think, opens up a whole new world. Uh, culinary, you know, in, in, a, in culinary speaking, I think you can really elevate your game by just doing a little research and, and understanding that this is where you, where you come from, but it's not where you need to live. And <laughs> it's so much fun to do things like that, like things that are not in your wheelhouse. Like I, my brother and I went to Seattle and I found this Chipino and, and, and they just did things up there so differently. Down here we do a low country boil, up here you do it completely differently and it's fun to go home right. and cook mussels and things that, I, that are not indigenous to my area. I cook lots of blue crabs, lots of shrimp, lots of you know, stuff like that. Sure. But to, uh, to do stuff that's outside of your wheelhouse is challenging and it's fun and it kind of keeps you on your toes. And to your earlier point, do a test drive before you entertain yeah, with it. Yeah, absolutely. Don't invite gonna, people over. I'm going to send these guys to Rochester, New York and see how they do on that indigenous food culture. <laughs> <laughs> What's indigenous there? Uh, Red Hots, basically hot dogs <laughs> is, is big, okay. and uh, they have a sauce. They actually, the sauce they put on it is called meat sauce, and it's essentially ground beef with ketchup mixed in and caramelized, and they put that on the hot dog. That sounds delicious. Delicious. That sounds delicious. It is. Have actually. you ever been to Canada and done the whole fries and gravy thing? Oh, sure, of course. The yeah, poutine. That's, that's amazing. And you know, when, when I was traveling uh, with QVC one time, we were in North Dakota doing a show, and I had never been there before, and we were invited to a local barbecue and they did pitchfork fondue. And I thought, what in the world is pitchfork wow. fondue? Giant barrels of boiling oil and big hunks of meat roast on pitchforks. Oh my God. <laughs> so basically, it would be the Jolly Green Giants version of fondue. You take this big pitchfork and you stab, all very clean, and stab into this big piece of meat and you cook it like fondue in this giant barrel. It was the most tender, delicious beef I'd ever had in my life. Wow. It had all been marinated, unbelievable. The visual that I'm getting is I incredible. I and we were on a mountain top, it was just <laughs> crazy. And was I'll this never a dream or was this really happened? This totally happened. <laughs> and so I think when you travel, I always encourage people to seek out, when you travel to a place you've never been before, ask the locals where they eat. You can get McDonald's anywhere in the country. It's always yeah, going to taste don't. the same. Go to the places, go to the locals, get off the beaten path. You know, if you, if you find somebody you trust who will not steer you wrong, you may find some great food. And that's how our restaurant in Savannah became very popular. When we first started in, in the beginning stages, it was in our house, which was completely illegal. But we, 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 we opened up a little uh, turnkey operation inside of a Best Western Motel in Savannah, Georgia, and we had a six-foot fold-out table, and we had the little chafing dishes and nice. where we did what we called a hump day buffet on Wednesdays. And word got out, and before too long, there was a line of people outside of this Best Western in Midtown Savannah, not even in the historic district, in, the, in Midtown Savannah. And it was pretty remarkable, but that's the way that it happened, was word of mouth, locals. And, yep. and now the locals hate that they ever gave away that secret. Uh, they always do. All right, let's have a pop quiz. What's in your fridge? What's always in your refrigerator? Always in my refrigerator. Outside of the cranberry juice for my vodka, um, <laughs> which is a fair and honest answer. Um, <laughs> yes, always is. in my refrigerator, garlic. All right, garlic, cranberry juice, and vodka down in the yeah. freezer. I like it. How about you, Bob? One item, olives. I've, I've been an olive fiend my whole life. My mama, this is on the verge of abuse. My mama used to take me to the, I used to go to the grocery store with her. And the way that she would con me into staying, going to the grocery store and staying there is I would say, mama, please go out, buy me a jar of olives. And I'm talking about the big queen stuffed green olives. And y'all, I'm not lying. I would drink the entire, all of the juice out of the jar and eat every olive and have a pound in migraine 10 minutes later and not understand how come. But to this, the look on your face, if I could, if you could see it, you, you know who I'm talking to, you, second row, yes, is just like this. If you don't like olives, that is gross. But I love olives of, of all kinds. You may need to borrow my vodka for that olive. Yes, you're exactly right. That's for the dirty, right? Because I, I live back and forth between California and Georgia, so my refrigerator is usually pretty bare. But well, I have to say cold. also, um, cheese is something I'm never without in the refrigerator because I do so much with it, whether I'm entertaining. And I also try to keep bacon in the fridge because I call it the divine swine. I think it's one of God's most perfect foods. And so um, 
I really love that whole, you know, staples in my in my fridge. Bacon is a staple. I think we can agree on that. I agree. I, I agree. think we have to uh, agree, that agree that's on that. So, Bobby, this is the first of your cookbooks that you've done totally solo. Right. And that's got to be a very different experience than working with your brother or working with your mom. It is. Can you talk about it a little bit, the process of putting this book together and how it was different? And, well, it's, it's so much better or it's worse. It's the best or book of all of our books that have ever come out. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, I, my, my brother Jamie and I did a show called Road Tasted um, on the Food Network a few years ago, and we had lots and lots of fun doing that. And we had a couple of books that came out uh, after the show that were relative to people that we had visited, things that we had done, businesses that we had highlighted. And that was lots of fun, but we didn't own the food. Um, and this book is, it's truly my life and my lifestyle. So it's, it's been interesting because I've been able to be completely honest and put recipes in there that I want to as light as I want it to be and not have to ask if it's okay. And um, I think that it's a very time appropriate book. I think it goes along well with the show. And uh, I think that it's, I believe that it's going to be great, but it's definitely a life, it's a lifestyle sort of mm -hmm. thing. Do you know what I mean? Sure. Um, but it's been tons of fun. And I have the good fortune of working with Melissa Clark, who is a of the New York Times. is a culinary genius. And we have a great time. We just sit down and talk for hours and we formulate recipes and uh, it's been a lot of fun. But I miss my brother. I don't get to work with him as often as I, as I used to. Well, you got plenty of time. Yeah, you I hope so. Hope so. David, how about you? You're, you? you are constantly working on recipes and developing recipes. It's a little different to do it for a cookbook. But, um, it absolutely is. Can you talk a little bit I about can. that? I can. It's, it has been an exciting journey. It's been, at times, uh, really wild and somewhat overwhelming because you're working with so many recipes all at once. When we're developing recipes for our show, we're working maybe a month out, so we're looking mm -hmm. at you know um, two recipes a week for you know four weeks, and so that's not as daunting to me. As we started putting together 150 recipes, and meeting deadlines and doing testings and all those kinds of things, it was extraordinary to me. And and as we were working with the book, one thing that that we did that I'm very proud of is that we gave some of the recipes to home cooks, yeah. and we said I want you to take these home and I want you to try them, and then we're gonna we're gonna come back after you've made them, and we're gonna talk about them. So I was able to sit down with some of these folks and ask them some questions. And some of the questions I asked were things like, how did you feel while you were making the recipe? Did you feel anxious? Did you feel successful? Did you feel confident? Did you feel like it was going to turn out? And did you feel like there was some joy in what you were doing? If I didn't get good answers to those questions, we went back and we, we, we worked on them again. Because we wanted all the recipes to be accessible. We wanted them to be um, the kind of recipe you wouldn't find intimidating, yeah. and the kind of recipe that you would be proud to make for your family and to be proud to, to feel very accomplished about. Because I want folks to buy the book and use the recipes because they're recipes that sound good to them, things that they're gonna be proud to serve their family, and things that are gonna make them feel good about themselves in the kitchen. This are, is a, this is a, excuse me, no, one second. Okay. This is a really important point, I think, about all three of these books, because I, I know Melissa quite well. And I can tell you that, that this notion that the recipes are gonna work that it's okay, everything's gonna work out, it's yep. gonna taste yep. good. Yep. You can make Thanksgiving, you don't have to have a you know, grossly fat meal that isn't great. It's gonna be great at 350 calories. Right. It's gonna, your Thanksgiving is gonna be great. Your mac and cheese is gonna be delicious when you get home from work. We worked hard on this, and the people we've worked with are excellent. Yes. Getting that feedback matters. Cookbooks are very, it's not like a novel where it's like, well, you didn't like it, you don't understand my art. Right. You know? <laughs> right. You didn't like it, that's a problem for me. I want that recipe to work. I know you guys do yeah. Uh, yeah. as well. It takes a, it's a, it's a very different thing, I think, from other kinds of food writing or, or, mm -hmm. or other kinds of I agree. food journal. And, and I think we're, that we're all trustworthy. I know that I trust David, and I know that I trust you and my family. I mean, we, I, we all know food pretty well, so you can trust the books are going to be good. What I wanted to ask you was, are you at home physically, like pen to paper, like I find myself doing when you guys are writing your books? Are you sitting at the kitchen table writing while you're, while you're cooking and testing things out? Because that's what goes on with me and my family, too. My mother's first cookbook, she literally sat down and wrote every bit of it by hand. Every bit of it is on paper. That's incredible to me. I've moved to the computer and destroyed a few in the process. <laughs> uh, you know? Yeah. Um, you mean like... 
and blown, no, up some, just, blown up some printers? <laughs> well, blown up some printers with the terrible pros, but, but I've ruined the, it's weird having a, and it's, the future is gonna be that we have computers in the kitchen at all, yeah, at all sure. times, yeah. but I find that business of working on the sauce and taking notes along, alongside, I, I kept going back to, to pen and paper mm -hmm. uh, as well. I did a lot of pen and paper notes as I was doing some testing in my own kitchen. And I would go back and I would tweak the amount of, of this, that, or the other thing in a salad dressing. I have a great um, recipe in the book for uh, iceberg wedges with blue cheese dressing yes. and with, uh, oh, with crumbled it. bacon Classic. again because I think everything's better with bacon. Love it. And, um, and I was going back and tweaking some of, the, some of the blue cheese dressing because I didn't like the amount of hot sauce I had in it. Mm -hmm. So I was always coming and, and making notes and wiping my hands and all my pages look like, you know, There's something about having a that, food blot. I, I love papyrus and I meet people that are, you know, the, all the digital stuff really scares me. And, and I think a lot of people in, that are in books, I think authors are terrified of the digital age coming because you fear people not wanting to buy books anymore. It's so convenient to, to download stuff. But I meet more and more people who enjoy cooking that say, I've got to have the actual book. I want the book in my hands. I want it to be dog-eared. I want it to be dirty. I want there to be you know, stains on it from, from use and, and all that stuff. Dog. So uh, I think we're in good shape as far as that's concerned. But I meet lots of people who say, I collect cookbooks. I've met a lot of people who say, I don't even cook, but I collect cookbooks and I just read them like novels. My grandmother, my dad's mom, uh, taught me to love cookbooks. Uh, we called her Mimi, I'm not sure why. <laughs> and, um, but Mimi, like your grandmother, lived to be 97 years old, ate eggs and sausage every morning for breakfast. She never worried a thing about there any of, of that yeah. kind of business. Yeah. And I think there was a time when you could do that and, and there wasn't an issue. But um, she was an amazing cook. But as she got older and could not uh, cook because she couldn't stand for long periods of time, I would always give her cookbooks at Christmas time and for her birthday. And she would call me and she would say, she would say, I love this book, I've read it cover to cover, these are the recipes I like and you've got to try them. You know, so it really is a love of great cookbooks. I had someone, uh, a bookseller, say, say to me last night, you know, David, the book industry has been challenging over the last many years. And a lot of us felt like um, in, the early, in the early going of this that cookbooks would be the first category to fall. And interestingly, they're the last category standing in terms of real books with real pages. Right. And, um, and the electronic right. age is, is here and will, be a, will, will, will become a part of our cooking. But I think to your point, Bobby, we're still going to always love to have those books that we can sit down and look at the pictures and turn the page and study the ingredients and run our finger down the page. It's just, I, I think there's so not too. really anything that replaces that. I think so too, particularly if you, have, if, if you have something passed down to you. My mother and my grandmother have passed down cookbooks to me that are uh, just so dear to me. I'll, I'll have them forever. It's good to have that collection yeah. going. I also encourage people, find your moms and grandmas and have them write recipes in their handwriting because that's yeah. a family heirloom that you can never duplicate. Yeah. Also, those recipes are key to preserve and pass along. It's family history. Yeah, yeah, it's family are. history. It's, it's like ornaments on a Christmas tree. Every time you pull ornaments out of a box, you remember the one that you bought and you got in the sixth grade and you put it on the over. tree. Yeah. yeah, it's like absolutely. a diary of your life. These recipes are that's a diary of your life. That's fantastic that you're able to do that. I have two young children at home, a large dog, <laughs> a number of cats. Those Christmas ornaments don't make it through <laughs> no December. Nostalgia. There's no nostalgia? I, there is every year as I see it fall <laughs> to, to the ground. So as, as restaurant uh, critic um, and now as former restaurant critic, I can't walk through uh, the newsroom or, or into a party or church or anywhere without someone saying, hey, listen, I need a restaurant. What's the best restaurant? What's the best Thai? What's the best Chinese restaurant in New York? And so if the number one question to me is about restaurants in food, what's the number one food question that comes to you, Bob? What's your mama like? What's your mama like? <laughs> I mean, I, I, honestly, it's the first thing that comes to my head. Well, the, what the, is she like? The questions that I get, oh my God, she's <laughs> unbelievable. She's exactly what you think she is. She's really, really sweet and fun and funny and down to earth and just lights up a room when she walks in and has got so many admirable qualities that, uh, that that I just, I, I admire her very much. My mother is the, is the person who sees the, the good in everything, sees the positive in everything, and she doesn't allow me to, uh, you know, to salt and, and pout, which I, which I do, but um, can I get a reservation? What's your mama like, and can you get me a reservation at your restaurant? Those are the questions I get a lot. <laughs> How about you, David? Well, you know what, I get lots of requests for different kinds of recipes, because one thing that I love, probably uh, my most loved food is macaroni and cheese, and I get, uh, I eat it in every variety form. I order it in every restaurant, everywhere I go. I'm the big kid who never grew up when it comes to that. 
So that's a signature dish in my cookbook, but I get lots of questions about that. Or I get lots of, you need to try my recipe for macaroni and cheese. Yeah. But speaking about your mother, I'd like to tell a little story on her. Please do. Because Paula wrote the, the forward to my cookbook, and I like to say that I met Paula Dean back in the day before most of America knew her. Yeah. Um, in Savannah, she was wildly popular and very well known, but she hadn't really joined Food Network yet at that point. Right. She came to QVC in 1998 for her very first appearance on QVC with, I wow. believe, Savannah Country Kitchen cookbook. Yes, yes. Wow. That was the very first cookbook. And I remember coming into the studio that night, or that afternoon, actually, and I had an hour-long cook show. And I picked up, um, we go to our operations desk, and I picked up my lineup for my show that night. And I remember this like it was yesterday. I said out loud, who is Paula Dean? And nobody knew. And they said to me, I believe she's back in the prep kitchen cooking. So I go back into our prep kitchen and I look around and I don't see anybody uh, that looks unfamiliar to me. So I said out loud, is there a Paula Dean here? And this little lady popped up from behind a table, covered in flour from her elbows to the top of her head. She was making cheese biscuits that you all used to hand out at the restaurant when people were waiting in line for over an hour to get their table because the Lady and Sons restaurant in Savannah is delicious. And if you haven't been, you need to go. And um, she popped up and she said, are you David? And I said, yes, ma'am, I am. She said, do you understand Southern food? <laughs> and I said, I'm from North Carolina. I know from Grits and Biscuits. She said, oh, good. And she hugged me and got flour all over me. Uh, uh. We went on the air that night. Her book sold out in six minutes. Oh, wow. And it was just, and that was how Paula Dean was introduced to QVC. I always like to say I met her before most people knew her. Yeah. And she has, uh, so to your point, what she like, an amazing woman. Isn't she great? Who has just absolutely changed, I think, the way people feel about comfort food. Uh, you know, I think for the longest time, you weren't really allowed to talk about deep fried and things with butter and yeah. all those kinds of things because she made that okay. Yeah. And she made that part of our, our general conversation. So she's been a big influence on me too. That's, that's really cool. And the fact that you remember the book and everything is great. Now, I said a few minutes ago that uh, my mother's first book, she, she hand wrote, it, which, which is true. And she desktop published, I'm about to tell a story on Pamela Cannon, my friend Pamela Cannon here from Random House, who I love so well, and thank you for everything. My mother wrote a, a cookbook in Savannah called The Lady and Son's Savannah Country Cookbook, and we desktop published 5,000 of those books. Wow. And we were terrified of what are we going to do with all these books, because there's no way that this is going to sell. And we sold them in our restaurant. I, to this day, I have one copy. My brother has one copy, and my mother has one copy of those 5,000 books. Well, once now, you go to the Library of Congress, maybe yours. <laughs> no, your brother, I, he's not here. I, uh, I, but I, I, gotta, I gotta say this. Pamela, if the, sto if the story is, is wrong in any way, correct me, or don't correct me, because this is the way that I remember it. This book was in our restaurant. Pamela happened to be in Savannah. I believe that it was raining and that you sort of just ducked into our place because it was raining. Um, Pamela Cannon saw the book, took it to New York, and called a couple of weeks later and said, or sometime later, I don't remember, this has been a long, long time ago, and said, I'm Pamela Cannon, I'm senior publicist, I'm publicist with Random House, uh, I've got your book here and we think that it's got merit and we would like to publish it. And my mother asked my brother, what is a Random House? <laughs> <laughs> so, but... Pamela and Random House published that book, and that's what became the Lady and Son Savannah Country Cookbook. And I have no idea how many millions it sold, but I'm certainly millions, right? That book has sold. So thank you very much. All right. Well, why don't we take some questions from you guys and see uh, see how that goes for a little while? We're not going to top that story. All right, so the question was, what's a recipe we live and die by for each uh, in, in, uh, in these books? Um, I'm, since I caught that, I'll, I'll answer first. Um, and I'll answer with a little bit out of left field. There's a, I think it's in this blad they've got in the back, but there's a cauliflower recipe in there. I'm not a big fan of throwing curve galls at, at Thanksgiving, but I think that this cauliflower that I've got in there, which has two ingredients in it that I don't usually mention, uh, to the people who are eating it, and one of them's anchovy and the other's breadcrumbs, is just fantastic. Crunchy, salty, delicious. And as I say in the book, no need to tell anyone there are anchovies in there. No need to court that kind of disaster with someone looking at you like you're serving them cat food. It's delicious. You boys? Bobby? Uh, well, I cook lots of fishes, and um, 
One thing that I really like to do, and I find myself doing it very often because it's so simple, is I do either a black sea bass or a cod, and it's basically a fish in papalote, but it's in tin foil. So it's a, a nice maybe four to six ounce piece of fish with uh, some cooking, some mirin or sake in there, uh, asparagus, shiitake mushrooms, a little bit of salt and pepper on it, and it's really, really light. I know it sounds like a very boring dish. It's oh, really, exactly. really light, and it's very, very good, and I love to do it all the time because it's just, it's so simple, and I find myself, um, I'm not married, and I don't have any children, so I find myself cooking for, for one person a lot, which is, you guys, it's, it's harder to cook for one person oh, sometimes absolutely. than it is to cook for a bunch of people because I refuse to throw food away, and I don't love leftovers, so there's kind of a, I got to find some <laughs> sort of a, a balance there. But fish dishes, man, I love to do. I love to do a tuna steak. I love to do a black sea bass. But that one that I just described is probably my favorite one. Today. I'm gonna try that tonight. That it's sounds very good. good, David. I'm well, guessing. I'm gonna go out on a limb and guess. Maybe mac and cheese. Well, mac and cheese <laughs> is my go-to. I love, I love, love mac and cheese. But there's one recipe I'm really proud of in this book. I do a lot of entertaining, and I love having folks over. I love doing lots of appetizers as opposed and heavier appetizers. Uh, as opposed to sit-down meals. I'll do that more at holiday time. But if I'm inviting friends over, I like to do a more, you know, kind of a meal replacement kind of spread of appetizers. Um, one of the things that I've always loved are, are pot stickers. And I can make a whole meal out of them. I have them everywhere I go when I eat out, and I love to make them at home. So when we decided to put together, you know, different and unique comfort food type recipes in the appetizer chapter, there was one that really kind of came together beautifully, and I'm so proud of the way it turned out. They're cheeseburger pot stickers. Oh. And oh, hey I have great love of cheeseburgers. I have great love of pot stickers. And so really, East meets West. And you make this, you take a, a store-bought uh, wonton and with only a teaspoon of ground beef, chopped American cheese, relish, mustard, ketchup, and Worcestershire sauce. Form all that together, <laughs> get it inside. And because it's just a teaspoon, it cooks in the pan as you pan, pan saute it, or pan, pan fry it. And then um, I developed a tangy steak dipping sauce. And it's much like the Cheeseburger in Paradise song. It's which way do I steer? I like mine with lettuce and tomato, <laughs> Heinz 57 and, and French fried. It's just amazing. And it, they're, they're crunchy and they're tender on the inside and they're flavors that you know. I love having people over and making things that they'll understand. You know, we were at a party recently and, and someone asked me, how's the food? And I said, well, the food that I know, I appreciate. The food that I don't really understand or they start giving me ingredients I'm not as familiar with, don't resonate with me. So I really feel like when recipes are understandable and they, and they bring together foods that you know and you, you recognize and you identify with, you can kind of go outside the box and take a cheeseburger and put it in a pot sticker and make it work. That sounds <laughs> 500 of those. I have to say, I they don't make me mad. I would, They're really, really, really tasty. You, uh, that's, one of those, that's one of those dangerous things. Yeah. I would stand around and I eat those. Just eat them all. <laughs> Be like oysters on the half shell. We have a question out there. Here's one up front. OK, so I'm throwing my first real dinner party this week, and I'm doing a Southern theme. So I'd love your, I'm a Yankee, so I'd love your real Southern boy. Just tips for uh, the atmosphere. I feel like I have the food down, but just getting the southern vibe good. I'm, I'm having a little bit of trouble hearing you, but oh, it sounded sorry. to me like you said you're throwing your first. My, I might do better with that. Yeah, tell me what you're saying. I'm, uh, I'm doing my first meal dinner party Friday, and I'm doing a southern food theme. Okay. And I feel like I got the food good because I cook a lot, but I'd love the advice for, you know, just the southern vibe in general. For How do you get the party. southern vibe? The southern vibe. Well, yeah. bourbon's wow. a start. Well, being in the restaurant. Bourbon's a start. Be, what'd you say? Bourbon's, bourbon's a start. start. Bourbon, bourbon, is, that is a good start. <laughs> that tends I, to take the edge off. I don't yeah. know. I, I, I'm in the kitchen. When I'm in the kitchen, I have to have good music. Uh, atmosphere is, is, means so much to me. It's always meant a lot to me in my, in my uh, restaurant. It's always been very important to me that we have appropriate uh, music playing for the type of music, that we, for the type of food that we serve. So um, I don't know, that's a very simplistic answer, but if you got some Ray Charles going, or you know, if you, if you got some, some really good Southern soulful music going, I would say that that sets your theme right there. Uh, but you said you got the cooking down, so you don't have a culinary question. What would you add to that? You know what? Um, when I've entertained before, and I'm not sure that this is uniquely Southern, but I like to eat outdoors in the warm weather. Nice. And one thing that I have done before is set up a table with a white tablecloth and go to, the, go to the dollar store and buy every white candle you can find, but make sure no two match. Yeah. Line the whole middle of the table with those candles because that's going to really make this fun, outdoor, summery, kind of white, gauzy feel because that feels very summery to me. Yeah. Lightweight linen, clothing, that kind of thing. Encourage your guests to wear white. 
because you don't, well, just don't serve anything that's of color. But um, <laughs> also what's fun to do, if you're wanting to really make it Southern, go and buy yourself a case of ball mason jars, the kind that they canning jars. Yep. She's and do and knows. do like a, a mint lemonade where you've got mint leaves in the lemonade and you know chunky ice and big uh, big round wedges of lemon in there um, and bourbon and, and serve bourbon. It. I'm and, telling you that's yeah. gonna help. Spray Tie your napkins up with a little raffia, make it kind of rustic and fun, and make it outdoorsy. Uh, it, you know, on a, uh, the weather recently, while Memorial Day was really really hot, it's kind of tempered now. So if you're gonna be cooking soon, it can be outdoors and the weather cooperates. Makes for a really nice evening. Throw a couple white twinkle lights in the trees, and you've got you've got atmosphere. I'm going to that party. I'm going to that party. I was going to right. say lather everybody in bug spray. That's pretty much what's yeah. going on in Savannah. And burn some citronella candles. <laughs> right. Yeah. All right. Who else do we have out there? Here's one up front. Hi. What is the biggest cooking mistake you've ever made? Oh, can I start? Please. <laughs> I've made many. But when early in my Thanksgiving career, we were talking earlier about frying turkeys, a buddy came over, this was our first time frying a turkey, and he came over with a brined bird. We didn't do the measuring with the water, we just filled it with as much oil as we thought was correct. The candy thermometer we were using to measure the temperature of the oil, maybe it worked, maybe it didn't work, I'm not sure. It could have been 350 degrees. It could have been 3,500 degrees in there. I'm not really sure. All I know is that when we got that turkey in there, um, it was really hot. And it, it kind of, it, well, frankly, it exploded the breasts <laughs> off the bird. The, the, they flew high. And oil geysered everywhere. And I, I learned from a police officer uh, that, that you clean that up with kitty litter. So we had some kitty litter there on the side. This was in it Brooklyn. It just gets more tragic, doesn't it? <laughs> this wasn't in Savannah. This was in Brooklyn. So there were all, that was a, that, so, oh boy, that was a bad, that's bad a, mistake. That's a good um, one. But I still do it. I figured, I dialed in after that. It's, and the recipe now is much better. I've, I've cut off all corners. Do you have a disaster? I doubt that you have a disaster. Well, you know what? Come on. My, my disasters probably stem from getting too ambitious trying to do too much for a dinner party. Yeah. You know, I think dinner parties should be equal parts of pre-preparation so you're not, you're not killing yourself on the day, of the, uh, day of the dinner or the day of the party, and also being willing to give yourself permission to buy a few pre-made things if it makes life easier. Spend your time on the main dishes where you really want those to shine. Don't worry about making fresh rolls. Take it from me, it takes too long and it's a big, oh no, it's too much. Buy those or buy the frozen dough and do, bake those fresh. Just give yourself some permission to, to, to balance things out so you're spending your time and you plan your time accordingly so that when your guests arrive, you're not stressed and pulling your hair out because by the time you've, you've done this and you've cooked for hours and hours and hours, you can't relax when you sit at the table because you're too worried disaster. about everything. Give and us so, a disaster. He, he I, bailed on the disaster. Y'all, this is so embarrassing, so I'm not going to go into details of it, <laughs> but I was at Kathy Griffin's house one time, and I'm not... I was at Kathy Griffin's house one time, and she said... Make a banana pudding. I want you to. I want. I want some banana pudding. She's a friend of my mother's, and and I think you do what she says. Uh, right. And I right? said, okay, sure. Or yeah. she'll talk about you. Right. And 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 I messed it up <laughs> right away. And I was so embarrassed because my brother and I have a great recipe for banana pudding. But I was so taken. I was so surprised when she asked me to do it, and I was so nervous when I went in the kitchen to start. I'm not going to go into the details, but I ruined it right away. Un, un, unfixable. I, it was unrecoverable. And I'm surprised that it's not a joke somewhere in her <laughs> act already, because it was very funny. There was another story, and this was, not ru this was not ruining anything, but this was interesting. I was, this was in Savannah in 1990, probably 8 or 1999, and it was on a Sunday afternoon when we at the Lady and Sons served uh, buffet only on Sundays. No nice. menu service whatsoever. And it was one of those weird days where it was, it was ghost town. And we, were, we closed at 5 o'clock. That was the normal hour. And I was standing in, in the front door. And we were, on a, at the very least, a skeleton crew. I had cut nearly everybody. I almost think I was there by myself. And the place was, was practically empty. And uh, there might have been one person back in the back that was tending to the buffet stuff. And I'm standing in the front door, as I often did, because I ran the front of the house. I was the guy, if you came and ate at the Lady and Sons, there was a certain number of years where you met me. And, <laughs> I, and I probably wiped your table. I definitely refilled your tea glass. You saw me. So I'm standing there, and I'm looking down. I'm looking, and it's so funny, because there was nobody anywhere. And I'm just kind of looking out of the corner of my eye, and I see this couple walking up the street. And as he's getting closer, I'm like, that's William Shatner. 
So it's William Shatner and a lady that was with him. I have no idea who the lady was. And he is walking uh, towards me like this way. I'm over here and he's walking and, and he gets to like, if I'm right there, he turns like this and right into my face. It was very William Shatner. It was very, it was very Captain Kirk where he turned and he was all of a sudden right in my face. And he said, how are you doing? And I said, I'm fine. And he said, I'm from out of town. Where, where, would, you, where would you eat if you were me? And I said, huh. well, sir, I know who you are, and this is my restaurant, so I would recommend that you please eat here. And he said, well, what have you got? And I said, well, and I knew this wasn't going to go over very good. And I said, well, it's fried so chicken and collard greens and macaroni and cheese and biscuits and cornbread and gravy and sweet tea and stuff like that. And he was like, mm, I'd really like a salad. <laughs> I said, come in and sit down. So I walked him in, he and this lady in, and put him at the best table that we had, kind of tucked away back in the corner. And I calmly walked back to the kitchen. And once I hit the kitchen doors, I busted through, and I ran out the back door. And Savannah is, it's basically rows of buildings. So there's our restaurant, and then right next door is another restaurant and another one on the other side. Well, we were, at this time, we were bookended. Are we getting the hook? We were bookended. I'll finish it up real quick. By two really great restaurants that were sister restaurants. They were Italian-themed restaurants. And I had a good friend. This guy was so awesome. He was just the gruffest, biggest, scariest looking biker guy that smoked Mar Marlboro Reds and just drank anything brown straight out of the bottle. <laughs> but he was an unbelievable chef. Well, our closing time was his, was their getting ready to get open time. So as soon as I got to the kitchen door, man, I busted through those doors and I shot out the back and I ran over next door to Bistro to Garibaldi's and I said, Ron, you got to do me a favor, man. William Shatner is sitting in my restaurant, and he doesn't want anything except for a salad, and I don't, ha I don't have the stuff to do what he wants. Please make me a, a beautiful salad. And Ron, with their plates, their ingredients, made me the biggest, Fantastic. most beautiful salad, and I brought it back over and presented it to William Shatner. And he had the best time and loved the food, and it's... I've always kept that a secret, but there you go. And Ron, and, and Ron, and Ron later on passed away, and uh, he was a dear friend to all of us, and, and uh, that's just something that I'll, I'll always remember. So not, not a catastrophe, but it was, it was a story. I'll tell you one thing about being with these guys. You got some pretty good stories. Yeah. It's pretty good. Do we have time for one more? Okay, great. Let's get another one. Another question. Hit us. We'll tell more stories. We got them. There's one right up there. Will you each say what your favorite recipe in your book is? I didn't hear what she said. She asked for What's our favorite, favorite recipe, recipe in, the in the book. I'm gonna say, uh, I have the, just my almost basic roast turkey. Not the basic roast turkey, but the almost basic roast turkey, which is the one that I've been cooking most often since college, since I first started cooking Thanksgiving on my own, which, which, is, which is not uh, tr totally traditional insofar as it has a little bit of a glaze on there, a little mirin glaze mm. with, with some rosemary and a lot, a lot of butter in there. And it turns the bird this lacquered brown color and gives this amazing scent to the house throughout the Thanksgiving. I kind of want to eat it right now for my <laughs> birthday. <laughs> that That's my favorite recipe. Happy birthday to you. Thank too. you, That's sir. Absolutely. That's Happy awesome. birthday. Uh, macaroni and cheese is obviously one that I'm very, very proud of. <laughs> but, if I, but I'm going to move past the obvious answer. There is a beef short rib recipe in my book that Ooh. I am really, really proud of. It braises in the oven for four hours, and it's got red wine as its braising liquid, and it's just fantastic. It makes this great gravy, and the, it's just fall off the bone. I serve it with a, a cheesy, creamy polenta, and, uh, and then a few mayonnaise drop biscuits to sop it up. I wanted to give you the high fat version before Bobby told you about it. <laughs> I know, man. I'm not but that is one of my favorite recipes in the book, beyond my macaroni and cheese and my cheeseburger dumplings. God, that sounds so good. <laughs> I have to say it, cheeseburger it's, pot stickers. It's unbelievable. All right, Bobby, what about you? Every recipe in the book. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm, being, from, uh, being from where I'm from, I've got a crab cake recipe in there that's really, really good, that's kind of on the light side, but really good. We uh, have the good fortune of being able to, I can walk out in my backyard and harvest big, beautiful blue crabs, and we take advantage of them down there. They're a bear, you know, to deal with. You could get tired before you get full, but uh, I would have to go maybe with that crab cake recipe. It's in that, it's in that, Vlad. I, yeah, I just, it is. I, yeah. I, I looked at that back, it looks pretty. Thank you. Darn good, Thank you. I have uh, to say. Uh, that, I, I, would, I would hand that to Random House. All right. <laughs> say that's why well, it looks so good. I think, um, I think we are coming to the end of our time here in this beautiful room. 
in the middle of New York City it's on a warm, sunny, <laughs> early summer day. And, uh, and we'd really like to thank you all for sitting and thank talking. You thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Enjoyed it. That was a lot of fun. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, man. Good, Good to see you, boys. David. Thank yeah. you so much.